Pues esta va a ser la presentación más corta de la historia porque yo creo que ya todo el mundo conoce a Sebastián Sánchez. Es, eh, es originario de España, pero adoptado de corazón, ¿no? Como dice yo, yo elegí ser mexicano. Cualquiera lo puede decir eso. Así que no tengo mucho más que decir. Sebastián Sánchez estaba en el Instituto de Astronomía en el DF y, y les va a hablar de zonas habitables en el universo cercano. Continuamos antes. Okay, so um, I promised to give this uh, talk in English. And by the way, um, first and all, I, I would like to apologize because uh, I, I didn't find the time to, to go. <laughs> um, I always love to go to the area and in particular, I mean, in Morelia, I say lovely, uh, but um, well, uh, time constraint was, it was simply impossible. Okay, I'm going to talk about something that is not Uh, the main topic of uh, of my research, but it's something that I'm very interested uh, for a long time ago, and I, I think that like hu hu as human beings, we may be interested in in this topic. That is basically the seek of uh, uh, of habitable regions in the nearby universe, and in general, what's the probability to find a region in the universe uh, that that is compatible with uh, with life. Of course, this is this is a very big uh, question, and and we are going to give just tiny answers uh, to that. Okay, so um, if you if you are interested, uh, uh, you can uh, read uh, the recent uh, um, uh, press release that uh, we publish um, uh, about the probability of uh, of finding uh, life outside, uh, not the Earth, uh, but uh, in the in the universe uh, as general. Uh, that's uh, a public release. Um, Uh, what well, so uh, the seek of an habitable region in a galaxy uh, first start with a big problem is that the definition of what, what's life no um, and by definition of a, of a region that uh, that may host a life uh, will be a region that fulfill the require the required conditions uh, to host life but uh, but since we don't have a clear definition of what uh, what is life. Uh, we need to uh, um, uh, constrain that definition to something that that is is more useful. No, so we are going to focus just on very particular uh, a very particular definition of life. So we are talking about the conditions uh, 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 not of uh, uh, any form of life. So not of uh, a stemophilus or or a weird a bacteria, we are a, a virus. Um, but we are going to talk about what are the conditions. To develop uh, multicellular life and uh, uh, forms uh, uh, and with eukaryotic uh, eukaryotic uh, cells, you know, cells with uh, uh, that have a nucleus and have a, a, a polymerous uh, a enclosure. Um, so, if you go uh, to uh, to the literature, I mean, the, the, there is nowadays uh, some some kind of a more or less consensus that uh, for a less restrictive definition of life. The conditions are more, more uh, fuzzy and less less uh, mm -hmm. uh, restrictive, but for this particular uh, condition of life, that is what the uh, usual people and stuff from from life, you know, the life forms like like uh, ourselves, um, uh, these uh, these conditions are very restrictive. You no, know? um, so it, it's possible to trace uh, a region uh, in our galaxy and in other galaxies. Uh, that fits uh, with this uh, definition of life or with uh, these uh, conditions, and and uh, and could we empir empirically estimate the probability of uh, of having life in the universe? So this is this is the big question because basically it's the question of uh, how probably is to find a place where uh, human beings uh, could be developed uh, somehow or the life as we understand. Um, so. <laughs> Let's make a brief summary of what are the conditions or the now nowadays uh, um, accepted conditions for um, generating this uh, kind of life. Uh, so generally, I'm going to pass over that quite uh, quick because it's not the main main topic of the, this talk. So, what are the, the required conditions for the system of life? And now, life it's uh, what what we defined before. Um, well, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I don't know. We we just have one bona fide sample of a, of a good location for for this kind of life. That is the Earth and and the Earth or uh, uh, neighborhood. No, so basically where we live. So with one simple sample, 
and uh, not knowing which uh, of these conditions are uh, really uh, um, uh, more important than others, so what, what's the hierarchy on, on these conditions, we more or less may define uh, uh, how life uh, was formed here, which, in, under which conditions. So we are living in a rocky planet, you know, it's a terrestrial planet by definition. Uh, it's required uh, to have water in liquid form. This is more or less a standard of what we uh, is accepted. Um, it's also accepted that uh, to form life, uh, you need uh, uh, dry, non-submerged regions. So you have, uh, you may have uh, not only a, a, a water uh, in liquid liquid form uh, in the entire surface, but you need uh, to uh, have continents and oceans because the uh, uh, area in between. Uh, the, 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 the shores of the continents are particularly interesting to, for uh, the standard of how life uh, is supposed to be uh, formed. Um, it's, it's supposed to require ample tides, and that uh, is connected with the moon. It's another topic I'm not going to enter now. Um, it's also required to have a sta uh, stable climate, uh, not sharp and wide periods of an unstable uh, climate uh, for a, a long period to uh, life to develop. And in general, uh, a lack of external threats uh, in an extensive period of uh, at least uh, 40 years. We are not going to tackle or, uh, all these conditions uh, in the seek of uh, habitable uh, zones uh, in, a, in the universe uh, under the context of the, this talk, but we are going to talk more or less about uh, the first ones, you know, the requirement of having a rocket planet and a water, uh, a water liquid form, and uh, in particular also uh, the requirement to have uh, uh, oceans and, and and continents, you know, no, not an entire, so to have an uh, orography uh, and not homogeneous surface, that because all these conditions uh, are connected with uh, a, met, a chemical composition um, uh, that uh, it's uh, uh, in a certain place in, in the universe, um, and and uh, regarding regarding the last uh, of the conditions. Uh, the lack of external threats. Uh, we also require to to have a certain surrounding stellar population uh, to the environment that we are going to look for, uh, just uh, to avoid at least some of these external threats. Um, so the standard knowledge of the origin of life, a part of estimophilus, I mean life. I remember is what I defined before. Uh, it's that uh, um, the formation of this autoreplicate system that we know we know as life forms requires a high concentration of organic molecules in a primordial, primordial enriched uh, sea. So basically, it means uh, the, uh, that you need a persistent uh, set of uh, uh, organic uh, molecules. Um, we, we need the, the, the tides uh, induce puddles, and these puddles get dry, and and, uh, and so humidity. Um, and, and drops and then uh, it's uh, uh, get refilled by water again and uh, and this uh, process of drying and 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 uh, getting uh, more wet um, it's uh, in the experiment so that this is uh, uh, one of the forms to form these uh, 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 enclosures uh, uh, that uh, that forms the uh, eukaryotic cells. Um, so uh, that that means that uh, that means that it's not only that you need a certain chemical composition, but you need uh, uh, also that the uh, rocky planets that are formed are not too big too big uh, to uh, to form just uh, a, a flat uh, orography, you know, um, uh, or lack of orography. Uh, and and this is basically pointing to a certain uh, chemical uh, composition. Uh, let's say in general, I mean, the distribution of metals uh, has to be in a, a certain value because uh, if not, you generate uh, two big uh, rocky planets and then there is no orography um, uh, uh, that uh, that um, can generate this, uh, this uh, difference between oceans and, 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 uh, and um, uh, continents. And therefore, uh, any tide will be totally uh, useless for uh, this requirement of generating bubbles. So, uh, it is therefore, in summary, uh, the requirement we are looking for is uh, to have a rocket planet uh, with a, a liquid water, tides, and a non uniform orography. So, this is basically totally tied to the, a certain uh, chemical uh, uh, com composition, or in summary, what we name metallicity. Um, and uh, furthermore, we need uh, that, the, that the, the, these conditions are stable for a certain uh, uh, length. 
And again, uh, why we, we require this condition of having like a 4.5 gig years of stability? Uh, that's uh, because this is the time period uh, that uh, we know from the single bona fide uh, example, uh, that basically the Earth. And in the Earth, the dependence of uh, eukaryotic cells took a certain amount of time. Uh, and uh, the, the, this amount of time uh, um, uh, to the generation of uh, the camera explosion, as you can see in this uh, in this uh, scheme, is uh, about uh, four giga years uh, since the formation of, of the Earth. So in all this period, you may not uh, have uh, events that basically destroy uh, or uh, cut off uh, 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 the, the ability of uh, uh, developing the, uh, 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 these uh, eukaryotic cells. So around four, 4.5 giga years of stability. In particular, uh, uh, we want to avoid, or it's required to avoid uh, the system of supernova and, and GRB explosions uh, nearby, because those explosions, we know that they, that they are uh, life killers. They ionize the atmosphere, destroy, uh, destroy the ozone layers, and uh, destroy the complex molecules. Um, you, it, it would be good uh, uh, to have also uh, to avoid the collision by asteroids that produce local heating and, and blasts and, and large dust clouds and uh, global cooling. But we are not going to address that, and and therefore our estimation of uh, where uh, to find uh, life uh, in the universe uh, it can lead only to an upper uh, probability limit because there are other and other restrictions that uh, may. Uh, uh, decrease the, this probability somehow. Um, so uh, the last two points is, is not uh, connected really uh, to what uh, we, we can do uh, now or what we have done now uh, with uh, the actual data. Uh, it's interesting to notice that uh, all these uh, uh, conditions, uh, rocky uh, planet uh, with a certain orography and a, a certain chemical composition and, and uh, water, uh, all this is totally connected with the chemical composition, uh, and the chemical composition, uh, as you know, is totally connected with the uh, uh, stellar population uh, uh, evolution in a certain vicinity. And we know that stars that they don't born isolated, so uh, in a certain uh, uh, um, so this, in a certain uh, location, like the location of the sun, uh, the star formation history is not the star formation history of our sun. Is start formation history of all the population uh, where the sun uh, was born. I'm not going to talk about migrations here, so we are going to avoid that complication. But uh, uh, certainly we know that, uh, for example, to have a certain chemical composition, you need to be in the correct uh, galaxy. So the chemical composition of galaxies depends on the mass of the, and the morphology. This is a plot uh, where I show the um, a mass metallicity uh, relation, uh, and in this case is uh, in the form of the oxygen abundance for different morphological types. And, uh, 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 and as you can see, uh, depending on the morphology and depending on the mass, uh, the uh, chemical composition, in this particular case, the oxygen abundance is different, but this is also happening for all other elements. So if, uh, if you are in a galaxy that is uh, uh, um, very massive and too early type, most probably you have a, a, a metallicity that is too high uh, for forming a, a, ro a rocky planet that has orography. There will be a very large uh, rocky planet and most probably uh, there will be no orography. So the conditions uh, will not be fulfilled. And if you uh, are in a galaxy uh, with a, a very low mass uh, and um, a, a late type, a later type like SD galaxy, most probably uh, you will have too few metals to form rocky planets. So um, just uh, by the uh, um, um, requirement of having a certain chemical composition, uh, you are narrowing down the kind of galaxy where you may find uh, uh, um, the, the right composition or the certain conditions for forming uh, an Earth like, uh, like, like our planet. Um, so our planet like our Earth, sorry. Um, so it's also important to, uh, to know that it's not only a question of in which galaxy you are, but at, at which galactocentric distance, at which location within this galaxy you are. Because uh, it's uh, well described that there are uh, radial gradients uh, that they chain uh, in the slope uh, also with the mass and the morphology. And uh, if you are in the too near the center of a galaxy, 
uh, most probably uh, you, you will be uh, to metal rich uh, and for the same argument that I uh, indicated before, uh, you will not have uh, the required conditions uh, to form uh, to be compatible with a system of life. And uh, if you are in the very out, outer part, uh, it will be the contrary. So you have uh, too few metals. So it's not only that, uh, it's uh, not only the uh, kind of uh, galaxy where you are, but also uh, and, and the distance. It's also the location within this uh, distance. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, this is uh, an, an ionized uh, gas uh, map uh, with oxygen three being uh, in blue and H alpha being in uh, 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 green and a nitro a nitrogen two in red. Uh, so the, all the greenish bluish uh, um, uh, regions here are classical H2 regions. And when you are near to an H2 region, more probably uh, you will be near to supernova, um, at least supernova, I could call it supernova, supernova uh, 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 type two. Uh, and uh, you may encounter uh, difficulties for having a stable uh, time period uh, um, of uh, uh, the stability required uh, uh, for uh, forming a, um, uh, well, for maintaining uh, the, the life as we understand it. So most probably inter arm regions uh, would be more compatible uh, with these uh, uh, regions uh, where life uh, may exist. Uh, so all these conditions uh, of uh, 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 may have a region to, to be habitable uh, has led to different studies uh, and most of them are theoretical studies where they run uh, a chemical uh, evolution uh, and stellar population codes. And uh, they basically, uh, here is a map of the probability of uh, finding uh, life um, uh, at different, uh, forming life at different uh, locations within our galaxy. Uh, so it's, this is a galactocentric, the, the galactocentric distance, and this is the time. Um, and uh, uh, most of the codes basically do exactly the same thing or very similar thing. And this is the actual location of, uh, of uh, the sun when it was formed, and uh, uh, um, well, this is now. And uh, as you can see, the, the highest probability was not exactly in the moment uh, in the location of, uh, of, of where the sun is, but uh, you can see there are regions uh, where, for example, when a, um, a star formation was uh, uh, very strong in the early epochs of the uh, evolution of galaxies. Uh, this is now, and this is uh, the formation of a galaxy. Then there were two uh, uh, many supernovae uh, in the outer regions. Uh, the, at uh, any uh, time, uh, there will be uh, too few metals. And uh, in, in nowadays, in the central regions, there are uh, too uh, much uh, metals uh, to produce the kind of conditions that uh, are required. So it's not only, as you can see, a question of where you are and in which galaxy you are, but also when you are. So it's uh, when. Uh, in the evolution of this galaxy, it's more suitable uh, to form uh, a planetary rocket and, uh, with these conditions that I expressed uh, before. So the sake of an habitable region in a galaxy, um, as I indicated before, it's usually addressed in a theoretical approach and, and with these chemical evolution models that I showed you before. Uh, our approach will be totally different. We are proposing a totally empirical approach uh, and um, with the basic premise or hypothesis that uh, the spectrum of a stellar population um, codifies its stellar composition. So that uh, is going to tell you what's the probability of having a supernova of any kind and the probability of having uh, gamma ray bars and all these kinds of things. It also codifies the chemical distribution, not just one element, as I showed you before, but all elements. All the absorptions that you see in this, uh, uh, not, the, not the, the metallic absorptions, uh, are basically telling you what's the chemical composition uh, uh, in these uh, stars. And in summary, it's also telling you what's the stellar evolution history. I mean, what's uh, what the star formation history and the chemical enrichment history. Um, so by looking to the spectrum, independently of uh, what uh, is the kind of, uh, what are the physical properties of this spectrum, we know that in there you have codified all the required conditions that we find in the vicinity of the Earth for having a planetary rocket with a certain uh, uh, density and a certain orography 
and a certain chemical composition that leads basically to the uh, for uh, the formation of life. So this is uh, this is going to be our uh, primary uh, target or my primary hypothesis. No, that just the spectrum in the vicinity of uh, the Earth or of the Sun uh, basically uh, um, contains all the required information to put an upper limit uh, to uh, the existence of uh, uh, of uh, of life in a certain location in the universe. Uh, well. Um, this, this is what I said before. It's uh, um, illustrated here. Here we have the spectrum of a, 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 a galaxy. So even in a galaxy or in a, in a, in a, a portion of a galaxy, uh, uh, all the, the, the observed spectrum uh, basically contains the information of all the stellar populations and the chemical composition. So all these absorptions here are telling you which is the uh, chemical composition uh, uh, of, of, the, of the stars. Uh, uh, of the surviving stars, basically, the ones that, that you see. Um, and indeed, the, this is used uh, for a long time ago, and uh, you have one of the um, uh, the, the main uh, contributors to that, that uh, Gustavo Brusual in your institute. So I, I'm not going to institution, so I'm not going to enter into that. But uh, we know that uh, in the spectra uh, of a certain portion of a certain location in a galaxy or in the entire galaxy, uh, it's uh, uh, included the information of all uh, the individual uh, stars that are uh, with with that codifies their their age and their metallicity um, uh, that are at this uh, particular location. And this is used in this uh, scheme in the right, uh, where you can generate uh, the complex uh, stellar population that is uh, a representative of a star or for the galaxy or for a region of a galaxy from uh, what we name single star populations and these single star populations, basically by some uh, uh, techniques that I'm not going to enter, codified all the uh, individual uh, stellar spectra uh, that uh, are uh, in this particular location. So the main message here is that instead of uh, looking to the physical properties uh, that defines the environment of the Earth or the environment of the Sun, what we are going to look for is directly for the primary observable, that is the spectrum, okay? So uh, how we are going to do that or how we have made that? Well, first, we need a representative spectrum of the solar neighborhood. So, and that was our first advantage that uh, we have access uh, to that. Uh, so we first derive the integrated spectrum in the solar neighborhood in a radius of, uh, of the order of uh, one uh, kiloparsec. Um, so I'm going to describe this part, well, how we have generated this spectrum, that, that per se I think is a very valuable result. Then we are going to look for regions in other galaxies with similar spectra. So it's a spectrum, the spectra in other places in other galaxies um, uh, should be as much similar as possible to this integrated spectrum. And for, use, for doing that, we're going to use integral field spectroscopy uh, uh, at the resolution of uh, one kiloparsec. Um, so basically we match uh, the two resolutions. And this by construction could be uh, the uh, solar neighborhood analogs. So this is the first step on this project, looking for the probability of life is to looking for those places in the universe uh, where the spectra is as much as possible, as much similar as possible as the spectra in the vicinity of the sun. So solar, that's the concept of solar neighborhood uh, analogous. No? So instead of looking to the physical properties uh, and that will be a theoretical approach, we're going to go through a, a, a pure empirical approach. So what we did, so first, we have this marvelous stellar library that is provided by the Manga uh, survey. The Manga it was one of the surveys that, uh, that uh, was part of Sloan 4, that is finished already. And uh, it was an IFU uh, survey uh, that was uh, um, exploring the spatial result uh, spectroscopic data uh, of a, a sample of 10,000 galaxies. But in the, in, in the process, uh, they have some spare uh, fibers that uh, in the in the, in the plate and they were pointing uh, to uh, of the order of thirty five thousand uh, unique stars and uh, from them uh, they could they have uh, like a twenty thousand with uh, good quality 
and this is a, a huge stellar library um so it it, it has as i said 10, 20 000, uh, unique stars uh covered in the well range between uh, 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 3800 and uh, 10000 astrons with an spectral resolution of uh, of the order of 2000 more or less and uh, on this library this large library uh, in an article led by uh, Alfredo Mejia and Orbaez in, in 2019, uh, in the 2021, sorry, uh, it, um, it was developed a, a code uh, to assign uh, the stellar properties to these individual stars. So you can uh, download the catalog uh, from this uh, location here. The code is named Kosha, and uh, it derives the temperature, the gravity, and uh, the uh, iron abundance, the alpha uh, relative abundance for all these individual stars. So we have this tremendous uh, data set, and uh, by construction, uh, these uh, spectra, these stars are located uh, near uh, the Earth. So uh, this is um, uh, the typical uh, representation of uh, artistic representation of the Earth and the location uh, where, sorry, yeah, not the, the galaxy, and the location where the sun is, is uh, in this uh, position here, or the assumed location of the sun, and all these points in here, uh, the uh, uh, gray points, correspond to uh, one uh, individual star in the uh, 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 master catalog. Um, this uh, also by definition, by construction, it's a uh, um, uh, catalog of stars. is in the footprint of Gaia, and the Gaia footprint is basically uh, in the early, uh, I think we use the, the data release two at the at the moment in that analysis. Uh, so this is the density distribution of the Gaia stars. Uh, there are millions of uh, these stars, and it's the most representative uh, sample of stars. Uh, in here, you have uh, the representation of the density distribution of the Gaia stars in uh, in uh, the same pinky uh, color. And, uh, and in, in, again, these uh, individual uh, pointings uh, in gray are the pointings uh, where are located the mass stars. So basically we uh, um, cross match uh, the um, manga uh, to the mass star library with Gaia. So we have distance from Gaia um, and uh, using this distance and uh, the uh, values uh, that we had uh, before, um, uh, derive, uh, I mean, the the the, uh, the properties of the individual stars: the temperature, the uh, gravity, the the metallicity, and the alpha enhancement or the alpha uh, abundance uh, of these individual stars. Um, that this is what is uh, down by Kosha. Kosha um, is, as I told you, is, uh, is uh, this code that assign uh, these uh, stellar properties to the individual stars. Um, Kosha used a machine learning algorithm uh, for uh, making this uh, um, uh, matching. It, it's trained with uh, both the theoretical and empirical libraries. And after its train is pretty fast uh, to run. Uh, so we have the uh, distribution. Uh, and this is the, the observed distribution of uh, uh, the, the different uh, stars in the uh, master catalog. Uh, in the typical diagrams of gravity versus temperature, uh, abundance uh, versus temperature, and um, uh, alpha enhancement versus the other uh, uh, parameters. Um, but as, it, as I told you uh, uh, before, um, we have uh, a, 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 all the stars uh, from master identifying Gaia. And this is particularly important because we know that the master catalog is uh, incomplete uh, and we use Gaia that is the most complete uh, survey uh, of stars in the in the solar neighborhood uh, to basically volume correct the master uh, distribution. This was the original distribution in the color magnitude diagram of the masters. And this is the uh, distribution of Gaia. And after applying this volume correction, we have the distribution of uh, uh, masters weighted uh, by a certain volume. Um, keep in mind that uh, uh, this uh, inherits all the incompleteness of Gaia, but Gaia is so far the most complete survey we have. Uh, so we basically match the volumes uh, to that of, uh, of uh, Gaia. And now uh, using that, we can correct 
the original density distributions that uh, I showed you before um, uh, using this, uh, um, basically are uh, found in here. This was the original ones. And after applying uh, this uh, volume correction, uh, the distributions are different. Uh, and these distributions are, are really more representative of the entire population of stars in the uh, vicinity of the sun. So now that we have uh, we have a catalog of stars with a, a, an individual spectra with well-known physical properties. And we have also a volume correction in a way that now for each star, we know what's the contribution uh, to uh, the uh, um, representative uh, population in the volume uh, we want to address. Uh, what we did is basically to coat this spectra weighted by the volume and having this volume corrected uh, spectra, what we have uh, is a characteristic spectrum of the solar neighborhood. Uh, we cut the distance to 1.4 kiloparsecs, they were basically the samples are more complete. And in, the, in, in this way, we will have the spectra that will be seen um, if we could integrate an aperture of one kiloparsec on our galaxy from outside. So if we would take an spectra with a fiber in a galaxy like our galaxy um, with this physical resolution, the spectra you will uh, have will be something like that. Just for comparison, uh, the, uh, the gray line in behind will be the spectra that you obtain if you don't make this volume correction. And the spectra that you see in dark uh, uh, is uh, the spectra that you obtain once you apply this volume correction. So this spectrum that, that per se, I think it's a very valuable result is the characteristic spectrum of the solar neighborhood to a resolution of one kiloparsec. Okay, so having that in mind, having that in hand, now what we are going to look is for uh, in other galaxies where we can find regions with a spectra as much possible similar to this one. Uh, so for doing that, we use uh, the Khalifa survey. The Khalifa survey is a survey uh, I'm not going to explain again because I have talked a thousand of times about that. It's an IFU survey in the uh, uh, nearby universe at the, about uh, 100 uh, megaparsecs. Um, and it has an average resolution of 0. Uh, kiloparsecs. From this uh, Khalifa survey data, and that's good because this is a resolution similar to the one we, we want to, uh, the, the, the one we have in, a, in our characteristic spectrum. So uh, it comprises uh, all kinds of uh, galaxies with different morphologies, and it's uh, uh, statistically representative of the population in the uh, in the nearby universe, once you apply volume cor right volume correction, it comprises of the order of ten thousand. Uh, sorry, of one thousand galaxies. From those uh, galaxies, we remove um, um, uh, all uh, um, highly inclined galaxies. Um, we uh, we keep only the relative isolated galaxies, so uh, galaxies under strong mergers or in clusters uh, has been removed. Uh, we remove uh, galaxies with evident AGNs because those uh, will, will complicate uh, our analysis and most probably uh, will, uh, will have uh, difficulties to, for, uh, for the kind of experiment we want to seek. And we end up with a very limited sample, that is that sample here, uh, that comprises of the order of 300 uh, galaxies. Okay, so from these 300 galaxies, if we compare the, pro uh, the uh, properties of these galaxies, uh, with the, the average properties known for the Milky Way, that is the only galaxy where we know that there is a solar neighborhood analogous. In this, there is where this, this is the solar neighborhood uh, located. So this is the distribution in terms of uh, morphological type. So this is the more or less consensus in orange of what's the morphological type of our galaxy. And this is the distribution of our sample. Uh, this is the distribution of masses. So, of our sample, and more or less uh, the, the width in here correspond to the accepted error bars in these uh, parameters. Um, this is the star formation, the current star formation of our galaxy, and the uh, distribution of star formations of the, this uh, um, uh, sample we are using. And this is the effective radio of our galaxy compared to the distribution of effective radio. And as you can see, our galaxy could be, well, one of the galaxies in this sample. You no. Know? 
Uh, so we are not biased towards Milky-like uh, uh, galaxies, and we don't want. And I will, I will Milky Way-like uh, galaxies, and I, I will explain you why. So what we did is was just a very simple thing. It was a key square comparison, where we basically take our uh, stellar spectra in a certain location in a galaxy. Uh, we take our representative uh, SNA spectrum, so the spectrum of uh, uh, that we have derived for the uh, solar neighborhood. Uh, we shift uh, by the recessive and the local kinematic, and uh, we fit the dust. And this is because we are uh, taking this spectra from the inside, but we are looking to the spectra of those galaxies from the outside. Um, so we have to uh, modify the the dust, uh, take into account the dust. Sorry. And so what we derive were will be maps of key square of how would uh, these uh, uh, two spectra match. No. So. Uh, in summary, we did the preprocessing first. This is an archetypal uh, galaxy, NGC 5947, that is uh, very similar to our uh, uh, to our Milky Way. And we have preprocessed all the data using our stellar population synthesis code that we uh, is named Pi uh, Pi Pi 3D actually, Pi 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 3D. And from uh, this uh, 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 analysis, we have derived dust extinction maps, velocity maps the uh, light side of velocity maps. Um, we have all the properties, the age, uh, the metallicity, um, and so on for the stellar populations, but they are not uh, that relatively important here. Um, since each individual galaxy in our sample is at different recipes, um, uh, the uh, actual resolution uh, of this data um, uh, changes uh, as uh, the, the physical resolution. Uh, and we want that all the data have the same uh, resolution that is uh, one kiloparsec. So we degrade uh, the, the maps uh, to all these uh, individual maps uh, to match the resolution of our actual data. And we use this velocity dispersion, uh, this uh, uh, velocity map, and this dust attenuation uh, to uh, apply them to the uh, uh, solar neighborhood uh, uh, spectrum, and once we have made that, then we can just run a key square uh, uh, pretty fast. So we don't fit these parameters. We use uh, the no, the values that we know for the different locations in the galaxies. Uh, we uh, convolve the data with the lines, uh, line of sight velocity distribution, uh, sifted by the velocity, and apply the dust uh, attenuation map, um, and then uh, we make uh, um, a key square map. So from this key square map, there are regions where we don't find, uh, sorry, galaxies where we find no solar neighborhood analog, and we find galaxies where we find a solar neighborhood analog. So from the original sample of uh, 300 uh, galaxies, we find an, uh, solar neighborhood analogs in 60 uh, of them. So it's quite a large number. If you consider, if you propagate that, it's basically one fifth of the galaxies we have looked for. We have found at least one region uh, that match with the spectra of the solar neighborhood. And here is where the things uh, begin to start interesting. Remember, this was our original comparison of the properties of the full sample uh, with the properties of the Milky Way. So what happens if we restrict these histograms to only those galaxies that host solar neighborhood analogs? Well, the distribution gets much narrower, as you can see. So we find solar neighborhood analogs in galaxies which, uh, with a morphology much near to the morphology of the Milky Way, with a mass more near to the mass of the Milky Way, with a star formation rate in a wide range, but not, not as wide as it was before, and uh, in a range of uh, uh, sites that is uh, more thick uh, around uh, what we find in our Milky Way. Remember that we were not looking for Milky Way analogs. We were looking for solar neighborhood analogs in galaxies, and this is the properties of their hosts, and they match somehow to that of the Milky Way but surprisingly, not as well as one may expect a priori. So just to illustrate that in a better way, this is the star formation rate versus uh, mass diagram uh, for the full Khalifa sample. Uh, so its point here is uh, one galaxy. 
and we find we see here the sequence of star forming galaxies in here and this is the cloud of a retired galaxies if you compare this distribution with our golden sample so this uh 300 galaxies uh, with low inclination removing agns non heavily interaction interaction so the galaxies we are used for this experiment we see that the, there is no strong bias in this subsample so more or less it's a, a super sample uh, that sample well the original distribution however if you look for the solar neighborhood analogs the distribution is really quite different so the the galaxies that host AGNs are not any kind of galaxy. They are concentrated uh, in between the star forming main sequence and uh, the retired region. There are very few in the retired region. There are some, some of them in the star forming region, but the vast majority is just below the star forming region. You may think, well, what is the Milky Way in this diagram? Well, this is uh, a plot uh, I took from uh, Bland Horton in a, a, a review, um, I heard had in the radio, review of 2016. And this is the location of the Milky Way, uh, in averaging the properties of uh, the people has derived for different, uh, and, and, uh, for different studies. And as you can see, the location is quite similar to the location of the galaxies that host uh, solar neighborhoods, but not exactly in the center of the probability. If you make a comparison, the uh, our Milky Way will be more or less at two two point five sigma from this distribution. What agree with these uh, plots that I showed you before? It's within the distribution, but it's not in the peak of the distribution. In other words, if we were looking for where to find uh, um, regions uh, with an spectra similar to the solar neighborhood. Uh, to look for Milky Way galaxies will not be the best choice. And that's a bias that the people have made uh, for a long uh, time ago because uh, they are primarily looking for Milky Way analogs when they should look for solar neighborhood analogs. So how how uh, are how compares how 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 the, we can compare the properties of the solar neighborhood analogs? with the properties uh, of uh, the solar neighborhood in our galaxy. Well, this is the distribution of different properties uh, around the colors are exactly the same as before, but now in, uh, in uh, gray, we saw the distribution of the solar neighborhood analogs of the 300 solar neighborhood analogs we have found in these 60 galaxies. Um, and in orange is not the properties of the Milky Way, it's the properties uh, of uh, the solar neighborhood uh, extracted from different studies. And um, this is the uh, age, the average age uh, uh, weighted in light, weighted in mass, metallicity weighted in light, uh, weighted in mass, the dust attenuation. Um, this is the most uh, complex thing to compare because uh, we are looking for the, from, the, from the solar neighborhoods from outside. And uh, in here, we are looking from inside. Um, this is the uh, stellar mass density in the solar neighborhood uh, compared with the solar neighborhood analogs. The star formation rate in the solar neighborhood compared with the solar neighborhood analogs. And uh, the galactocentric distance uh, um, scale to the effective radius of the galaxy. Um, and as you can see, uh, there are properties that match uh, pretty well, uh, but there are others where uh, we have a marginal um, um, a comparison, like for example, the luminosity weighted uh, um, uh, age. Um, in any way, uh, in all cases, uh, the, and, and the solar neighborhood is uh, at uh, uh, 2.5 uh, 2 sigma. This is the worst case, but in, for the vast majority is very near to the peak uh, of the distribution when there is a clear peak, no? Uh, so this is expected because basically we have constructed the solar neighborhood analog spectrum, um, 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 just taking all the spectra and volume weighted them uh, around our sun. And as I, we indicated before, this codified is, is codifying all these parameters. Uh, but uh, it's a good, um, um, a good sanity check that indeed uh, looking for properties uh, instead of uh, looking for the spectra the similarity in the spectra will lead to uh, essentially the same kind of uh, result. Uh, yes, uh, we are approaching the end of this talk. Um, 
where are the solar neighborhood analogs? Well, let's come back again to our archetypal galaxy. And uh, this is the um, uh, key square distribution uh, where uh, this uh, um, a solid uh, white uh, line indicate the regions that are uh, more probable uh, for finding a solar neighborhood analog. And as you can see, and this happen is happening in basically all galaxies, they are more or less distributed in an uh, annular uh, region. Uh, the curious thing is that while in our galaxy, this annular region is at about two, two galactic safety distance, two effective radius from the, from the center of the galaxy, in the rest of the galaxies, uh, this is located at different distance. And why is so? Because for different morphological type and different masses, the solar neighborhood analog is more near to the central part in the case of the less massive galaxies and, uh, and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, later types. And in the case of the, on the contrary, the more massive galaxies and the, uh, the more uh, early types, uh, the solar neighborhood analogs are uh, located in, in the farther uh, regions. This is, this is a consequence of the uh, radial uh, gradient evolution in galaxies and uh, it's uh, somehow expected. Well, just in summary of what we have found, and this is the first step for this sake of uh, uh, the probability of life, and we have uh, not finished uh, that part. We have developed a completely new empirical approach based on observational uh, uh, data to look for the solar neighborhood analogs. We find in the, near, uh, in, the, in the nearby universe 300 of those analogs, regions of one uh, kiloparsec uh, size, that are compatible with uh, uh, the solar uh, neighborhood uh, in 60 galaxies. So there are galaxies where we find only one and there are galaxies we find uh, more than 10. Um, so uh, the solar neighborhood analogs are preferentially found in intermediate uh, uh, spiral galaxies with a mass of the order of 10 to the 11 solar masses. And they are located in the average or intermediate star formation state, so in the Green Valley. Um, the, as expected, the physical properties of the solar neighborhood analogs are similar to the uh, physical properties of the solar neighborhood, uh, what is a good consistency test. Uh, and curiously, the Milky Way does not seem to be a good archetype for a galaxy that hosts solar neighborhood analogs. Uh, so um, maybe it's not even a good uh, archetype for, uh, for a galaxy hosting life. We have many things to do in the future. And I'm going to just uh, summarize that. We want to explore these solar neighborhood analogs in a uh, spatial result. We want to uh, look, for, uh, expand this uh, uh, search for uh, our own galaxy when we have enough data. Uh, we need to know, uh, we introduce uh, the uh, problems of migration in this analysis. Um, we want to increase our sample, uh, looking for other data sets like the Milky Way mapper of Gaia uh, itself. Um, and the ultimate goal is to uh, make an estimate of or uh, estimation of the of the upper limit to the probability of life in the universe, and we are making calculations uh, uh, regarding that. And we want also to look for why there are this vast majority, the, the vast the, the range of uh, of number of solar neighborhood analogs in different galaxies. There are galaxies where we have like fifteen of these regions, and uh, why there are galaxies that we have none or only one and how this evolves with time. So just as an example of what will came next, this is the location of the, our solar neighborhood analogs in the spatially resolved star formation uh, uh, versus stellar mass uh, diagram. So in here, its position is a location in a galaxy. So this is the star formation density and the star formation stellar mass. And here, this is the location of, uh, of uh, the solar neighborhood. And as you can see, the probability distribution of the solar neighborhood analogs uh, does not peak in the location of the of the solar neighborhood. So we are like in the case of the Milky Way, we are in a marginal like a two sigma probability place for finding um, a, a region compatible with what we understand from life. So you want to see more details? Yes, I refer to the article, and um, that's all. One full hour. Good. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for the thought provoking talk. So let's see. Um, are there any questions in the auditorium? Yes, we have questions. Go okay. for it. 
I so a, a couple of questions. So uh, first, when you select your uh, sample in Khalifa, you said you uh, you discard uh, galaxies with interactions, uh, which I guess is a major interaction, not like uh, uh, Magellanic clouds. No, no, yes, a major interaction, something a most true thing, yeah. And, and, and the second, so on average, you find, on very broad average, you find five uh, solar neighbor analogs in, uh, in, in your sample. Um, and in you say yes. and, and that, uh, in, uh, that the Milky Way is borderline with the common properties. Yes. So this means probably that we are very unlikely to, uh, to live in a galaxy with other solar neighbors. So we are the only one. Well, that's that's that. I, I don't have the answer to that, uh, <laughs> but it may be well pro, uh, well possible that if we don't find uh, um, we have remember that we have a one kiloparsec uh, radius volume here, no. So most probably in our galaxy, we will not find other place at this distance where we. Could be compatible with uh, uh, the kind of uh, of uh, requirements that we are seeing here. I mean, the, the, uh, an aspect similar to this one. I still don't have an answer. Maybe when we have the full Milky Way mapper, um, that it's going far far away than than our, our current uh, data sets, um, we may say something about that. But from the probability distribution for those galaxies, uh, for no, from the number of, of solar neighborhoods that we find in galaxies like the Milky Way in uh, our sample, the probability is pretty low. Okay. Do we have another question here? Yeah, yeah. We are fine in the auditorium. Okay, thank you. On Zoom, we have a question from Gilberto. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. I have several questions, but um, so to, to start, four and a half billion years is a lot of time. Yep. So we will expect that the sun has migrated, has moved, the neighborhood has evolved. Uh, is that is it possible to consider that? Is Are your models including the evolution of the Solar but neighborhood. Actually, I'm not using any model. You know, I'm I'm just using data, so I'm comparing data with data. So uh -huh. in the, in the so this is behind the one of the hypotheses, or you know, one of the hypotheses that basically the solar the actual solar neighborhood, uh, it's a, it's a compatible with the solar neighborhood uh, or the population of solar neighborhood when the uh, uh, when the life uh, start to form you know so that's yeah that's, that's a big caveat and I, and I we indicated here that we have not considered the possibility of migration um but uh, the point is that uh, stars usually they don't migrate individually they migrate also in the in the chunks where they are formed uh it's uh, it's complex then dynamically that you form from a molecular cloud so you can they can migrate locally but to, to the to the, the orbits of a group of galaxies that has formed from the same molecular cloud and um, I mean some of them are not but in general they can move uh, in, a, in a in a galaxy and uh, and most of the uh, simulations you make a, a, this kind of particle tracing in dynamically, um, and you put uh, 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 all the stars in an area of one kiloparsec, the probability that these get disgregated, let's say that they are full, uh, they are apart. They move, but they move together. That's the okay. point. Mm -hmm. And so I think we are more or less safe in that in that uh, in that uh, uh, in that sense. It's okay. true that our sun may have moved relatively. To the to the stars uh, in the, in the cluster that it was formed. That's uh, yeah, but mm -hmm. uh, how much? I don't think it's relatively. Absolutely yes, all the chunk, but relatively to the rest, I don't think it's going to be uh, uh, more than one uh, one uh, kiloparsec. Okay. Uh, but uh, we need to came back to the dynamical simulations 
and prove that uh, in detail. I mean, from the thesis and articles I have read and the questions I have made to the dynamicist, uh, they, they don't think that this is going to be a big issue. Okay, thank you very much. And may I do an, a quick question? And yeah, it, you, it's related to more to the introduction, not so much to the work you presented here. But I, when I was in kindergarten, they used to say that uh, other substances like methane, for example, will have the same uh, solvent and thermodynamic properties as water. So have we learned something why people is not considering other solvents and they, they're considering only the presence of liquid water when looking for okay that's i i i i try this introduction was just trying to avoid that the, in the <laughs> sense that, um you can define conditions probable conditions for life in a very in a much much broader um, um and less restrictive approach that i said here you know yeah. and and those that uh, that uh, that assume other solvents uh uh, may say no. That's, uh, this. This is not what I name life. So the, all the introduction was basically forcing to what we usually understand for life. You know, for the common people will understand for life. That is, you know, multicellular life forms uh, compatible with our chemistry of life. Okay, ah. and 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 uh, this is a very restrictive thing. But uh, but this is. The, I think this is the most important thing. You know. Uh, because it's the, it's the, we are looking for, let's say, a region where we may find a chemistry of life similar to what we find here. Other chemistries of life are not considered here, and and uh, and uh, we first we need we will need to for doing that we will need to find how to construct a reference spectrum of uh, what I will be that chemistry, and it, I have simply no answer to that. Yeah, yeah, I understand that you need to restrict uh, your de your definition of life. Yeah, but my my question was, have we learned something? Why other solvents are not considered? But is but is is nothing. Your other people are considering. Uh, yeah, there are people that are considering that and speculating in many in many ways. Okay. And and on the and furthermore, I mean. Uh, there are other. This, this is what I said. This is uh, the the high probability. I mean the an upper limit probability because there are things that are more restrictive. I used to give talks about the importance of the moon in, for life, and and most probably the presence of a moon like the one we have now in 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 the Earth. It's that is very complicated to generate, but that uh, that uh, probability is re decreasing very fast if you impose that that condition. So you may find the right chemistry, the right uh, right uh, rocky planet, and maybe you don't find all the other conditions. So the, the most we can do is to place an upper limit to that probability. Right. And, and this particular form of life. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Gilberto. Are there any questions, uh, any more questions in the auditorium or on Zoom? No. No, no, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. we do have a question. Go ahead. Yes, Just a really, really brief question. Uh, is the, the way you are calculating the integrated spectrum in the solar neighborhood uh, not, um, how do you say when this, uh, this kind of problems that you have a lot of sets that give you the same uh, answer? Uh, yeah, that it generates. Yeah, the generates. Uh, have you tried? To find if there's some degeneracy to 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 those uh, model spectra for the uh, solar in, solar neighborhood. But which kind of degeneracies you are you are uh, considering here? Uh, because I I not I not uh, I not working with the uh, physical properties and just uh, characterizing the the spectrum. So. The interpretation of physical properties was just to the this plot where we compare with the physical properties where we may find very well find the generalities between the parameters uh, uh, derived here was just to demonstrate that uh, we have a consistency, but uh, uh, we we don't model this spectrum. We just uh, uh, quad uh, in a I don't know intelligent way or 
funny way yeah. to take, consider the volume. So mm -hmm. I, I, I know. I get it. How you're calculating the the model spectra, but I was wondering if um, there's some kind of a specifics of the history of in the solar neighborhood that uh, give solar neighborhood its current state, right? So if there's not a guarantee, that means that all these other uh, fitted uh, uh, pro uh, similar solar neighborhood in other galaxies have the same kind of history. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's not it's not a degeneracy. It's it's, it's a fact. Uh, if 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 we uh, calculate the star formation history from this spectrum, something we should have done and published, by the way, <laughs> a long time ago, and we uh, and we uh, uh, calculate the star formation histories uh, and the chemical uh, enrichment history of those other locations in other galaxies, they should be compatible, uh, and that's that's what is behind this uh, this idea is that uh, the spectra is coding uh, this, uh, this star formation history and chemical enrichment histories. Um, so we go to the principles. We could have made that, that analysis and, and compare for the star formation histories. But instead of doing that, we have gone to the primary observable, that is the spectra. So looking for uh, uh, similarities in the primary observable. Uh, but uh, yeah, if there is a degeneracy in the derivation of uh, properties, uh, this is this will be propagated through all of, of them, no? To, to both to the solar neighborhood analog and the solar neighborhood uh, spectrum. Okay. I don't know if this answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Loha has a question. Please go ahead. Okay. It's, it's, sorry, it's not Laurent, it's Rosa with Laurent's computer. Okay. Hello, uh, very, very nice exercise. Um, however, we know that the solar system went through spiral alarms. Yes. We know that the, our galaxy had an active AGM at some point. And there were mammals, <laughs> there were mammals alive. So at, at least some for, forms of mammals. So there must be life in places with slightly different spectra. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I I agree that uh, this is a, that, that 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 may well. I not completely agree. I mean, yes, it's true that they, uh, our star may have crossed uh, the spiral arms, uh, and when that happens is a, is a, a question of debate. In the case of the AGN. We had a, an activity. I'm not totally sure that we have evidence that uh, we have uh, gone through an AGN phase. But AGN is a very broad definition. I mean, what I'm pretty sure is that our galaxy did not have a strong AGN. So the ones that really ionize uh, the uh, 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 distance of uh, two effective radii, this is these are monsters that uh, are. I think they are hardly compatible with the star formation history that we know from the uh, 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 from our galaxy, because it will have quenched the star formation uh, dramatically. And this we have not seen in the star formation history of our galaxy. So yeah, all galaxies with a bulge eventually uh, go through an AGN activity, but uh, AGNs uh, are could be tiny or huge. So I don't think that this um, and and it's true that we may we may have crossed um, and actually if you go here to the probability distribution um, in this uh, solar neighborhood analogs the probability is higher in the inter arms maybe you don't see clearly but even in the arms you have you still have a probability so the the major constraint uh, is the galactosecond distance so in the center you see nothing. In the other part, you see nothing. Uh, so you have an annulus here. And then in the interarms, the probability rise up. However, you still have a probability here. So crossing a spiral arm is not the major constraint. The major constraint is the galactosantic distance. It's, let's say, more gentle to life to be in an interarm region. These are the spiral arms. Here and here, if you don't see the, the screen. Ah, sorry, I'm pointing to the wrong screen. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, here. So this, this, is, this is an annulus, no? And the spiral arms of this galaxy goes in that way, 
no? And in that way, okay? So more or less these regions that you have the peaks are the interarms, but you still have a probability. So spiral arms are not the killers in here. The killer in here is the gastrocentric distance that defines the chemistry in a much better way. So I don't know if this uh, clarifies this point. Well, more or less, okay, because the sun takes 250 million years to around, right? Yeah. 16, and, and then you would cross the arms twice every 125 million years. And there were mammals 60 million years ago, at least, no? When, when the... Yeah, and we had good luck that, that there was no supernova nearby. Uh, I mean, this is a question of probability. So the, the, if we had the bad luck of having a supernova explosion nearby, and we are affected by this supernova explosion, there will be mammals, and then there will be dead mammals. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, fortunately for us, no. So that's why I'm talking that this is a, um, um, an upper probability. Any other event uh, decrease the probability, but the primary probability will be that. Uh, and, and again, I illustrate in this uh, diagram here. So the first, uh, the primary distribution is an annulus uh, crossing the spiral arms. So even in the vicinity of the spiral arms, you may find regions that are at a certain level, two sigma. So this is one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma. So there are two sigma uh, range in the spiral arms where there are still some kind of probability of, uh, of this kind of, uh, of uh, uh, compatible, compatibility with the solar neighborhood uh, analogs. Uh, but it's less probable than, the, than, the, than the within the spiral arms. And again, if you are crossing the spiral arm and you, because supernova is having some, has some stochasticity uh, uh, in, the, in the process, and, and you have the good luck of non-encountering non a supernova, well, this is like crossing Tepito. You know, you may cross without any encounter, or you may have the encounter of your life. I don't think we disagree. <laughs> we agree. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rosa. Okay, let us uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thanks to you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Have a good afternoon. Yeah. Bye. And thanks. Thanks very much.